Like most kids, I suppose, I grew up with a lot of my dad's and my uncle's hand-me-down stuff, including binoculars. And the challenge with handing down binoculars is way too often you have one eye that's a little bit fuzzy and another eye that's kind of zoomed in way over here somewhere. So it was a great thrill when I finally got to buy my own really good set of binoculars, or really good for me, set of binoculars. And the challenge when you bring the new binoculars home is to get everything focused in. So you take the time and you get the one eye adjusted well and you get the other eye adjusted and then they're both looking at the same spot and there's this magical moment when you get the center viewfinder to bring you all to the place where everything is in clear, crisp focus. And that moment of coming to clarity is a beautiful thing. There are times in our life where God brings all of these different things together and all of a sudden we see and focus what we thought were random different pieces and God brings them in together and we're allowed to see them in that beautiful clarity in that focus kind of had one of those in the last week I'd love to tell you it was intentional <laughs> and I'm sure it was it just wasn't on my intentionality God is the one who brings these things together for his purpose and at his perfect timing it was one of those amazing sequence of events. It starts with this life coach that I've been working with, Ken L. Roberts. And he's been asking all the right questions, helping me to identify my strengths, my giftings, my passions, who it is that God made me to be. And I'm coming to a firmer conclusion that I'm just a guy who knows God and loves him and loves leading people into a real relationship with him. Part of that passion has always been for missions. I got to, in 1990, go on a missions trip to Cameroon, West Africa, and absolutely loved my time there and fully expected God was going to leave me on the mission field or take me back there at the very least. And when I was in college and was praying about it, God said no. And that was just confusing, even frustrating to me. And I, I prayed about it for years and years till I finally had God explain it to me. And he said, you know, Matt, you're going to be able to accomplish more for missions by staying home than you ever would be if you went. And I didn't really understand that, but I, I, I took it at face value. I said, okay, God, if that's the way it is. Next piece of the puzzle that God helped bring into focus was these Sunday school lessons we've been working with, where we've been trying to learn how to read the Bible at different levels. And we started off by talking about the need to pray over it. And so before we get digging in too deep into our lesson here, I do want to stop and do that. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to read your word and to learn from it. We would ask that you would give us clarity today to know who you are, to know what you expect of us, to understand the texts as we dig into them and these big terms. But most importantly, Lord, how are we supposed to live for you and because of you? So guide our time now, please. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been going through these lessons and God used it to bring the clarity around. If you remember, uh, kind of the central idea of what Paul's been talking about as we've worked through Galatians, he's been defending his gospel, the gospel that he's been taking to the Gentiles and saying how he had this straight from God. And even when he took it to the elders in Jerusalem, that the elders in Jerusalem didn't add anything to it except... They did add one little thing in Galatians 2.10 that they wanted him to remember the poor also. So they were saved by faith and by grace, but there was one thing they wanted him to do, and that was to continue to remember the poor. So I began to wrestle with that and meditate it and compare it to our world and say, who are the poor in my world, Lord? I would assume you've had similar experiences to mine where you go to help somebody who's crying out for help and maybe it's somebody you haven't met before or you don't know very well and, and you get there maybe to drop off some food or something and they meet you at the door with a pack of cigarettes and a yard that's colored with expensive cans and bottles and there's a car in the driveway that my family can't afford to own and you sit there and you scratch your head and say wait a minute these are the people who i'm trying to help and honestly i'm I'm not convinced they're exactly as poor as they say they are. It feels more like they're making bad decisions. So Lord, who is it that you want me to help? Who is the poor that I am supposed to be reaching out to, remembering, Lord? 
And that was my question. We just left it there in my heart. God, okay, I'm willing. I want to remember the poor like you had Paul remember the poor, but I need to know who is the poor that you are wanting me to focus on. Then last week we started into our sermon series in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And that's the seven-week series where it's talking about, or it's Jesus talking about the end times and what to expect. And last week was before the end, what was the world going to be like? And so he explained that there was going to be wars and rumors of wars and natural disasters, including famines. And as I was in the final steps of putting together the PowerPoint for Sunday's sermon, I got an email from my friend Pastor Andrew over in Kenya. And it was a very short and to the point email saying, we're starving between the floods and the locusts and now the coronavirus on top of everything we have somewhere around 50 people in our church who are highly vulnerable and desperately need help and all of a sudden god brought all of these things together into pure clarity for me and showed me aha here's something you can be a part of matt here is one of those reasons why i left you behind now I bring this up for a couple of different reasons. First, I want to encourage you to be remembering the poor. This wasn't just something that was expected in the Old Testament. It wasn't just something that the early church had as a value, but it is something that God wants of all of us. As an overflow of His love in us, we are to be loving one another and loving those who are in desperate need. For the last couple of weeks, we haven't been, or excuse me, last couple of months, we haven't been able to get together on the first Sunday, and that's when we take our deacon's offering. But during this time of chaos, the deacon's offering is still getting used. And so I would encourage you, you can still donate directly to the deacon's fund by just putting a little mark in there or somehow letting our treasurer know, letting Harley know, that this specific offering is going to be designated to the deacon's fund. By doing that, you are allowing us to continue to reach out to the hurting and the needy. The deacons, when they heard about this need with Pastor Andrew, made a decision to give uh, a gift to send over to him. And we have sent a wire transfer over to his church this week to help feed the poor there. You know, our deacons fund is just one way you can be a part we have in the past opened up other funds like the Nicaragua project where we sent Bibles and bicycles down to Nicaragua to help out pastors. Or there was the uh, fund where we opened up, that we opened up for the camp to start in Lebanon, a Christian camp in a Muslim country. Now we have the opportunity to do the same sort of thing with the expressed desire of helping poor Christians in Northeast Africa who are facing starvation, it's a terrible time over there. If you would like to give towards that, the church is going to figure out a way to open a fund, and as we open up that fund, we will send your money directly to the people who are in the most need. It's a wonderful opportunity for us as a church to come alongside of a church over in Africa that is preaching the good news of Jesus Christ and make sure they have the tools they need to protect their own and love their own and their community and the orphans in their community so the love of Christ radiates out. There's really two reasons I bring it up. One is I want to encourage you to be a part of that and making sure we remember the poor. The second reason is I want to remind you that this is why we're reading the Bible. We are reading the Bible so that God can speak to us. We want to hear from God and we want to become obedient to Him. Reading the Bible just as an act of obedience is okay, and that's a, an acceptable motivation. But it isn't likely long, strong enough to carry us over in the long term. It's often not enough to keep us going. So we start reading for obedience sake, and then we move on and we start reading... Because if we're going to read it anyways, we might as well understand what we're reading. If we're going to read it, we might as well have some kind of a picture of what God's talking about. So we dig in and we started looking for the facts. The who, the what, the when, the why, the where. So we understood what was being said. We wanted to have the knowledge. We wanted to have the understanding of what the culture, the context was. And so we begin to read it in the context of the scripture. Where else does it talk about this? And what else does the Bible have to say about it? Then we asked ourselves to stop 
and begin to meditate on what God has been teaching us. Well, this is true. This is what the Bible says. Now, how does that relate to our world? What in my world is like what was being experienced in the biblical world? Then as we recognize that there is a correlation between where I'm living and the world I'm in and the world of the Bible, we come to this point in time where we realize I need to do something about it. It's just not enough to read about it and say, yeah, that's nice and walk away. We don't want to be that person that James warns about in James 1.22 who hears the word and nods assent and then goes on about their life as if nothing's changed. Friends, understand, knowledge in itself is a dangerous thing. 1 Corinthians tells us that knowledge has a, a tendency to make people proud. And we can get very satisfied and very proud of the fact that I know all of these things. But that isn't the purpose. Knowledge can also make us blind. It can bring us to this place where we think we know enough or that somehow we are pleasing to God, that God is satisfied with us because we know a whole lot of trivia. And it's not about knowing a whole lot of trivia. We don't please God because we have mental assent to the facts that he's laid out about a historical past. Facts are not enough. The devil and half of the atheists I know have a whole lot of facts. They're very smart. They know the Bible. Facts are not enough. God doesn't expect us to just have knowledge. He wants us to step into it. He wants us to step out and live it. He wants us to walk by faith according to what we know. It actually becomes a sign of obedience, a sign of love for God. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's our goal. We want the love of God to come into us and flow out of us. And a result of that is loving him in a way that we are obeying what he told us to do. If we're going to be obedient, we have to know what we are supposed to obey. The surest way to know what to do is to read what he has already told you. Again, the surest way to know what to do is to read what he has already told you. I've known way too many people who just want to uh, think they can just jump into Scripture and come up with this great prophetic plan of knowing all sorts of extra things, and they have confidence in their heart that they've heard directly from God, and they haven't done any of the homework. They haven't even read the book that He gave them. To try to put God, words into God's mouth and try and get Him to say things that they think sound important, but they don't even know the words that He has already written for them. And too often the things that they think they know are really in direct conflict with the things that he has clearly told us. It blew my mind when I was in seminary. Uh, we were in a preaching class, and these are people who are working towards their masters of divinity. So we are expected to have a biblical sound background. We're in this preaching class where we are being taught to te preach different sermons from the Old Testament and from the New Testament and from the Psalms and the Proverbs. And so this particular lesson was on preaching from the law. And so I put together a sermon that was very clear and really very simple based on what God had said. And it was a peer review class, so we sent the a sermon out to all the other people in the class, and then we came back and sat in the front of the room, and they were able to tell us what their experience was with the sermon. And the very first comment I got was from a woman who was very mad. And she closed her arms and she closed her eyes and she just squinted at me and repeated three times, I was offended. I was offended. I was offended. As if by the third time I hadn't understood what she had to say. And I'm not sure what she expected me to say or what I could say. <laughs> because what I had said was simply repeating what God had said. But somehow she knew better than the word and expected me to live by her special knowledge instead of what the written word was. The surest way to know what to do is to read what he has told you to do. My kids hit me with a riddle this week. I wasn't prepared for it. 
What is brown and hard and sticky? Well, a stick, of course, <laughs> which brings me to my riddle for you for the week. What is black and white and red and wet? The answer is a person who re has read the Bible and understands it. If you read the Bible and if you understand what God has said, and if you understand what he expects and his holy perfection, and you see yourself in light of what he has written, it should bring you to brokenness and repentance. Nehemiah chapter 8, chapter 9, the Israelites have come back into the promised land. They have rebuilt the temple. They have rebuilt the walls. They're in the midst of a celebration. And Ezra the priest stand up, stands up and begins to read the law of God. And the celebration quickly goes towards tears and mourning. And Nehemiah has to have the people stopped. Stop the mourning because this is a moment of celebration. There'll be a time for mourning. And so then the time of mourning came and the people spent a fourth of the day in confession and in broken tears before God. Friends, when you read the words in black and red, and until you have read the words of God in black and red and have experienced the brokenness of repentance that God has said, don't get excited about some extra revelation that you are expecting God to give you. He has already given you so much revelation in his word. It, it's kind of like going to a gymnastics practice, first day of gymnastics practice, so that you can do a triple backflip this afternoon. You may be able to get there. And in this case, I would say, yeah, you will get to the place where you could hear the word of God audibly at times, very rarely maybe, but you will know when he is speaking to you and it'll be clear. But that doesn't come at first. Not, not the audible, not the prophetic knowledge, not a, a word of knowledge or a word of truth. The first thing you get is the word that is truth. And once you become familiar with hearing God in his word, and knowing and doing what he has told you, then you can progress on. He's never going to tell you something that is directly, expressly contrary to his written word. So we start with the written word. I want to give you another illustration because I feel so strongly about this. If you could picture our soul as soil, and this is that springtime of year where a lot of people want to get excited about getting out and planting and getting the crops or the flowers planted, getting the black dirt all tilled up really nice and soft so that you can put the seed in and it has the opportunity to begin to grow. Our soul is the soil. God's word is the seed. He plants it in us, expecting it to grow and take life. And our part is obedience. And if you will, the obedience becomes a soft, gentle spring rain that adds to the soft soil and helps produce the beautiful life. Obedience adds to the soft soil, but when we are disobedient, it's like a hot baking sun in the desert of Arizona. It makes the soil hard and cracked so that the life that was trying to grow often dies out and it's very very hard to get new life started in fact usually at that point in time what it takes is god to create some kind of a massive earthquake and come through with his tiller and break the soil down again so that it has a chance see friends our obedience and our disobedience it adds to the ability to grow. The more we are obedient, the more we will hear from God, the more obedient we can be. The harder heart we have, the harder soul we have against God, the harder it is for us to hear from him and to get that next seed planted. Do you want to hear from God? Do you want to know that still small voice and have it guiding you? Start by obeying what he has already told you. Allow your obedience to prepare the soil for the next message. If God can't tell you things that are obvious from his word, how else should he hope for you to hear? 
If you want to hear from God, obey Him. And you ask the question, we begin to decipher, what do we do? We're reading now at level five, it's at a consequence level. We're reading to have the Word of God affect me. Not looking out and seeing how it compares to my world, but looking to see how does it affect me because I want to change. We are seeking to become obedient to the God we know. And I have to ask a set of questions now. It's not the same questions as before where we're just asking to understand. Now we are asking the new set of questions. What do you want me to do, God? How should I live now? How am I supposed to act? How am I supposed to think? How am I supposed to talk? Lord, take this and move me, God. Use this to move me from the intellectual to the practical. From knowledge to practice. Move me from my head to my hands and to my heart. Move this from my mind and put it into motion, Lord. Move it from what I should to what I do. Begin to read the Bible in a new light. So now we don't just know. We don't, know how, we don't just know how it relates to our world, but what am I gonna do about it? What difference is it gonna make in who I am and how I'm gonna live? Some places are really easy and obvious. You know, you read the Ten Commandments and God says, thou shall not. Okay. It's very easy to understand what God expects. Then the question is whether you're willing to do it. Uh, in the Proverbs, it tells us seven things that God hates. And it doesn't take much imagination to figure out if God hates that, I probably don't want to do that. In the New Testament, Jesus said, you must be born again. Very simple, very straightforward, very clear. And notice that these can come in a do or a do not. We often focus on the, the do not end the things, the thou shall nots. But understand, uh, James 4.17 says, Therefore, to the one who knows to do the right thing and does not do it, to him it is sin. If God asks you to do a good thing and you are unwilling to do the good thing, that's as much, as much a sin as when God tells you don't do that and you turn around and do it anyways. So again, some things we will find in Scripture that are just right out in the open. And they're easy for us to find, and we have to ask, am I going to do it or not? Some things are not direct statements, and so we end up looking for ways that things apply. In Galatians 2.10, we are not told that we need to remember the poor. What we are told is that Paul was encouraged to remember the poor. But it, again, takes very little imagination for us to say, if this was something important enough to be brought up for the Apostle Paul, then this is something that I need to be conscious about. I need to be, need to be intentional about. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, these things, Now these things happen to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. That means that the Old Testament was written as a bunch of examples for us of good and of bad. So a lot of times in the Old Testament, we won't find the thou shall or thou shall not, but we'll find the life of Abraham. And you watch the life of Abraham and you say, you know, he really did a good thing here when he left everything to follow God by faith. I need to be like him. We read the life of David and how David, uh, oops, he fell for adultery. And we're not told to fall for or that we're not to fall for adultery, but the obvious implication is, okay, Lord, this is a dangerous thing that I need to avoid. Or Jonah, or Daniel. There's all of these examples in scriptures that we read and we say, okay, is this something I want to be like? Is this something I don't want to be like? What is the hero of this passage doing well or doing poorly? Some statements aren't direct, so we look for ways that it applies to our world or to our life. Some statements are deeply encapsulated in context or theology. There are some passages that are just hard to read. There are some passages that are just hard to understand. They're tough digging, they're tough mining, 
And so it's going to take work on your part if you're going to say, okay, God, what kind of a person do you want me to be? It's going to take extra work to find from every passage. Some passages require a lot more digging. That's really where today's text for us is at the end of Galatians chapter 2. So again, if we're in Galatians chapter 2, pick it up and read for us here. I'm going to begin reading in verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in the hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, If you, being a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like a Jew? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ. We're going to stop right there. So if you look at verses 11 through 13 and you ask yourself, okay, what is the central idea again? What is Paul trying to say? Well, Paul is saying that Peter was not acting right, that he's acting like there was something wrong with being a Gentile. There was a division between Gentiles and Jews still. And so Paul's calling Peter out on the hypocrisy of saying it's okay to be a Gentile Christian, but not living like it's okay for them to be Gentiles and feeling like he has to remove himself. So what is that? Well, it's, it's racism. It's saying you've got to be a Jew and Jew is good and, and Gentile is bad. So then we make the transition from their world to our world. In our world, we still deal with racism. There are still churches where it is culturally unacceptable to have somebody of a different color, a different ethnicity, and that's not biblically correct. We shouldn't allow our hearts to go that way. So what do we do today? Uh, what are we going to do to be different than that? We have to have our arms open, our hearts open, to including people from all different walks of life and to loving people who don't look like us or don't sound like us. We ask ourselves then, are there other ways that this would play out today? Not all of the division in church anymore is based on ethnicity. In fact, the church in the United States has improved quite a bit on this. Not perfect, but we are better. Are there other ways that it's played out? I think a lot of times there's a religious caste system that's been put into place where some people are the, the cool kids, the people who have it together, the people who have good jobs, they have good money, they hang out with each other and they interact with each other because they have a natural connection. They see the world in the same way. And in the same ch ch church, you will have people coming who are poor, down and outers from the other side of the tracks, and they don't get invited into the cool kid clique. They won't be allowed to come to that small group. Or when we're sitting around in fellowship time, they won't be invited in. In fact, they're kind of looked upon strangely if they try to enter that group. And, and we all know our clique and where we belong, and so very quickly they migrate to a different place in the church. And there's no partiality with God. And there shouldn't be any partiality with us. So in the same way, Peter was withdrawing from certain people because there was people more his class around. And Paul calls him out on it. We need to be very careful not to be leaving certain people behind because we don't think they fit into our class. Another way you can read a passage like this in order to try and understand what God is teaching, is to read it from dif different people's perspective. When you're reading it, you read it from Paul's perspective. You're reading it from his person. But Barnabas was there. Barnabas got led astray by Peter. 
He followed Peter, who was obviously one of the great religious leaders of his day, and he was wrong. So in the lesson there is, don't blindly follow religious leaders. Just because he's a big shot doesn't mean that you should be following him. You can read it from Paul's perspective and say, he's given us a solid example, and we need to be willing and ready to stand up to those who aren't living the truth. You could also read it from those Gentile Christians in Galatia, from their perspective. I bet they were hurt. Now, obviously that's an assumption reading in, but it's not a hard jump of faith to make. To have seen Peter, to have interacted with Peter, but then to see that all of a sudden Peter was acting like he was too good for him because other people were around, that had to hurt. Now, if they lived through that, they need to recognize that leaders are human and can be wrong, but need to be forgiven and loved anyways. Sometimes when we read the passage from the different people involved, from their perspective, it gives us a, a new insight on how we are supposed to apply it to our lives. Let's come back to our text. Jump in at verse 14, going through 21. We go in there and he talks about how he wasn't straightforward with the gospel and we got down to verse 16 and all of a sudden Paul starts throwing in two-bit theological terms on us. It says, nonetheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Now, uh, to justify is to declare righteous. And I'd like to do a context study with you and go through the, the whole Bible, but again, there's way more there than we have time for in our short lesson. So I, I've kind of selected it down and brought it to where there's some bite-sized pieces for us. So we can at least get a partial understanding from context what the Bible has to say about this big topic of justification. First thing I'd like us to notice is who does the justifying? Talking about a man who came to Jesus. He says, but wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, who's my neighbor? Of course, if you're familiar with the text, justifying himself didn't work very well, which makes sense in the light of Luke 16, 15, where Jesus said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of man, but God knows your heart, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. So just because you think you can get by with it in your heart, God knows, or, yeah, get by with it. God knows your heart. And as he knows your heart, he knows what is proper and what is wrong. And you won't be declared righteous based on what you think, because God knows better. So Romans 8, 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, who declares us righteous. So biblical justification then is God's declaration that we are right, that we are right with him. God is the one making the declaration that you are right or you are not right with him. So how do we get this justification then? How do we get God to declare that we're right with him? Romans 3.24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So this is, for us, a gift. There is a process that happened through Jesus Christ, but as far as we're concerned, it's a gift of God's grace. Romans 4, 5, But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. We are to believe in him. We are to have faith. And that faith that God is going to do what he said he would do, God credits that to us, as righteousness. Romans 3.20, because by works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The law, the Old Testament law of Moses, the thou shalt and thou shalt nots, has no means to make us right with God. There is no way that that Old Testament law can say you're okay with God. It can show you where you're wrong with God, and it can show you how to put off the punishment for that wrong. But it doesn't have any means to forgive us and make us right with God. Romans 3.28 
For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. It isn't about works of the law, it's all about faith. Now, you will notice that Romans has a lot to say about justification. And actually, I believe you'll find that Romans and Galatians are probably two of the main places in the New Testament where God talks about justification. And really, Galatians seems to be a condensed form of what Paul is teaching in Romans. However, there does seem to be a little contrast. Romans 4.2, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. That's what Romans 4.2 says. Now, let's check one other place, because James also has quite a bit to say about justification. James 2.21, Paul says Abraham was not justified by works. James 2.21, James says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his hands, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see, that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Okay, so Paul's saying Abraham was not justified by his works. James is saying that Abraham was justified by his works. At first blush, these really feel like there is a disagreement here, that there is some kind of a conflict. But I live with the conviction that Scripture is not in conflict with itself. There's no contradictions in Scripture. There's just ignorance on my part. So I need to dig in and try and understand what are these both talking about and how do I understand them together? So we're going to do that by jumping back into James and we're going to back up so we understand the context. James chapter 2, verse 12, so we can read up into what he's talking about. So speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What use is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that save faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and be filled, and you have not given them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may say, well say, Ah, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellows, that faith without works is useless? Hmm. So in James' context here, some important things to note. Uh, Paul was talking about works of the law, works of the laws of Moses. James, on the other hand, seems to be talking about works that are done out of our faith, as we live out of our faith, or an overflow from our faith. Because we have faith, we start to live this way. And James uses the same example as Paul is excited, excited about doing, taking care of the poor. Carefully read, they're not in conflict. James is just continuing on from where Paul was leaving off. Paul is saying, the works don't save you. But clarifying that, the way you know you have the faith is there will be an overflow as you live out your faith. There's got to be works to go with it. There has to be a do. It can't be just a mental, uh-huh. Uh-huh, that's nice. But it has to be things that we are willing to put to practice. How do you know you have the faith that saves, that God recognizes and is justified? You know you have that faith when it overflows out of your life and the works are there 
and evident for all eternity to see. So how do we get justified? It's by God's grace. It's an act of faith that overflows into our life. What are the results then of this justification? 1 Corinthians 6, 11, Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. <laughs> it's the whole salvation process. What is the result of, of justification? God brings us from who we used to be and not only declares, but he's also going to sanctify. He's going to make it so in our life. Romans 5.1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the result of justification? We have peace with God. God declares you are righteous. He's no longer going to hold your sins over you. You're not accountable for them. And now you're at peace with God. Titus 3, 7, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. By his grace, we're justified, and that makes us an heir of eternity. <sighs> Armed with that understanding, we go back to our context and we read again how Paul is arguing these same things out in Galatians in a very condensed, very thick, deep form, saying you're not going to be saved by works of the law, that you are not justified by works of the law. No one is justified. No one can be justified by works of the law. Not the Pope, not Mother Teresa, not Billy Graham. None of us are able to do enough good to be justified by the works of the law. There's the old joke that if... People could get into heaven based upon what they had done. They'd all be sitting around in heaven bragging about it. And one old preacher would talk about how he'd given 10,000 sermons. And a missionary would stand up and say, Yes, but I gave my whole life to go to the Congo and reach an unreached people group. And the pastor's wife would stand up and say, Yeah, but I was married to the pastor. And honestly, if there is any place that a person could earn grace, that should be it, having to live with a preacher. And all this is going on, all, on, and all of a sudden a man stands up, beaten and bruised and kind of blackened still, even though he's in heaven. It's taken him a moment to get healed up from whatever he just went through or whatever's going on. He said, oh, I, I got here because I stood off a motorcycle gang and rescued a little old lady. They were all shocked and said, wow, when did that happen? He said, about two minutes ago. We can't be justified by our actions. We can't be justified by having stood off a motorcycle gang, rescued a little kitty from the tree, or having gone to the Congo with her husband. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus' death was enough. And believing that, making the decision that this is my only hope, the only way I believe I'm going to be right with God is because Jesus Christ died and forgave my sins. And so I'm accepting that and saying, you say this is true, God, I believe it. That's good enough for me. I need no other proof. So we come back to our fifth level of reading and ask consequences. What difference does that make in our world? Well, the connecting points. Do you know people who are still trying to earn their way to God, who think that I've been a pretty good person, and so that's somehow going to earn them grace with the Father? Instead of worrying about somebody else, is there a way that you are trying to earn grace with God? Or, taking the other side of it, if you have been saved by faith, how are your works showing that faith? If you were to be judged from the outside, somebody who didn't know you, would they see enough evidence in your life to say, yeah, that one's a Christian? That one obviously has the, the hands of Jesus Christ all over his soul, all over her soul. Look at the soil and the way it's blooming in obedience to God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Reading through the rest of chapter 2 is heavy. It's hard work. And if you're going to read through there, you're going to have to work hard for comprehension, and you're going to have to work hard to apply it to your life. 
And here's the deal. There are some passages that are going to jump off this page and speak to you because God has got you at a place in your heart, in your life, and in your Bible where they all come together and he says, this is the thing I want you to have clarity on. Use your binocs, zoom in here, see this. There are some places where it is not so easy. And there are going to be days where you read the Bible and you say, hmm, yep, nothing really hit me today. It's okay if you don't get an application from every text. But you do need to have your heart and mind open to it, looking around saying, okay, is there something God wants me to see from this? I want to close with three real quick points. First of all, remember that knowledge of right and wrong is only half the game. You must ask the tougher questions. Okay, I know what it says now, but what am I supposed to do? And what am I going to do? Time with God, time in His Word in the morning needs to have room for that time of commitment. I've heard you, Lord. I've seen what you said. Now what am I going to do about it? Second, be honest enough to be careful. We as Christians tend to be very good at celebrating specks and ignoring logs. We like to see the places where we think we're okay. The little victories where it's like, I'm not as bad as I used to be. We like to see those little places, but we tend to be blind to the places that we really need to work on. Too often a people attempt to live under this mask of perfection, or at least pretty stinking good. And we think we're all right. We know better, we know we're all sinners, but we haven't had to recognize the sin lately. We haven't had to be broken in repentance for a while. And so we think we're all right, and we think if we're all right in our eyes, we must be all right in God's eyes. I want to ask you to be honest with the text. Honest enough to be careful, to wrestle with it, to do the heart check and ask God, okay, search me and know me. See if there's any wicked way in me, Lord. And if there is, would you bring it into clarity? Would you bring it into focus so I see it as you see it? That brings us to the third. Allow the word to be living and active and sharp in your life. Let it dissect you. Let the Word of God dissect you. The goal is not to somehow run a bluff on God as if you think you're going to be able to convince Him you're okay. You're not going to fool Him. He's the Almighty God of the universe. He's seen 10 billion people go around this earth. He knows before the foundation of the earth, He knew what you were going to do wrong, and He knows where you're at today. He knows your very heart. You're not going to bluff God. So instead of trying to walk through life acting like, I'm okay, I'm okay. Go into your time in the Word asking God to do the work and dissect you. To show you where these faults are. The goal of reading our Bible is broken repentance saying, Okay, God, I don't like that. I want to be different. So go in and ask the Lord, show me what you see. Lord, show me in me what's wrong, what I need to change. God, show me from your word, show me with that crystal clear clarity what it is you want me to do. Because God, I want to be obedient to you. And then when he shows you, be willing to take the time and stop and celebrate the fact that you have heard God speak and be broken and repent and say, okay, God, I am sorry I was that way. Would you change me now? Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word continues to work in us. That even though we've maybe have read a passage a dozen or a hundred times, that this might be the time that you bring it into stark clarity in our heart. Father, I'm asking that this week you would help us as we read your word to understand what you want of us. What do you expect of us? 
That's what we want to do, Father. We want to live in obedience. So speak to us from your sure word. And as we hear, help us to move in obedience to you. Make our soil soft and plant the good seed, we pray. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thanks again for joining me this morning. I hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.